Found a little nematode to start off with. Hey, Samsung, how's it going? Same to you. Uh, Nuka Sign, this is actually um, from some sticks that I collected from the roof of my house and from my uh, from my driveway. A sort of combination of uh, lichen-covered sticks from two different places. Um, it looks like it might be from my pond, though, because there's uh, nematodes and and rotifers, but uh, nope, just stuff that was living on some sticks. Uh, Sam, thank you for the subscription and from continued support for the stream. It's delightful. I hope you had a good Christmas or holiday season. Whichever is applicable. And that you got a little break from work. Chippy Flip, hello. My sister and her brood didn't visit from Ottawa this year, so my holidays. <laughs> Uh, not a fan of your sister, apparently. Uh, we went home to visit my family, so I wasn't streaming during that period. And, uh, so I was in Ohio for about a week. And, uh... One of my family members came down with COVID while we were there. So we're in sort of semi-isolation until we figure out whether anybody got it here. But it's also been about a week since we saw them and we haven't um, developed any obvious symptoms. So I'm not sure that anybody here has it or if we have it, it's so mild that we're not really noticing. They're fine. Uh, they just had a mild fever, basically. And uh, no one else in the household there got sick. There's a little water bear. You can see it's, uh, it's got its little legs churning. Let's see about my scale bar. No, that's the right scale bar. Didn't have it right before this, but it's right now. You may reach out to me in the new year about converting your Nikon Labophot from Xenon lamp to LED emitter. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how well I'll be able to answer that question, but I can definitely try to help. There you go, you can see, oops, if I would get it back into the field of view, you could see it. Water bears have eight legs. If you're a regular in the channel, you'd know that for sure. And uh, the two back legs are sort of uh, grasping legs. This one's kind of a mess. It's got its whole body kind of scrunched up. And uh, the front six legs are sort of independent from each other, but the back two legs are a little bit like, sort of like a scallop or something. They're, they're sort of pointed or hinged backwards. And, uh, and they mostly use them for grasping things while they search around, bumble around, you might say. This one's one of those sort of uh, armored, I guess they call them, water bears. It's got these sort of red colored uh, exterior. It's actually quite large. 
let's see, the skinny of it is I bought in a uh, red, green, blue, white emitter because I thought it would be interesting to view subjects in different wavelengths, but if you think that's a bad idea, I may just ditch the emitter and go with white. Um, I don't know, it depends on what you're looking at. Uh, but a lot of times the, um, uh, the different colors can be, you know, they can show you some things that you wouldn't normally see, uh, or highlight certain things. Um, sometimes people just do that with filters, right? Uh, to try to get at the color corrections or the color combinations. A lot of times the, um, for microscopes, people will use, uh, just filters either inside the microscope or, um, or put some filter, uh, in a level somewhere in between the light, uh, and the objective. And... Um, uh, some organisms seem to look a little bit better in like green light, for example. Um, this one's got like a neutral density filter in the, in the body to try to, um, change the sort of quality of the light that comes in. Never considered filters. Well, uh, filters are kind of the cheap way of doing things. Uh, changing the light source is probably a little bit more authentic. And if it's, uh, you can change the individual, like, um, red, green, and blue independently. Um, so you could sort of get whatever kind of color combination you want. Uh, it might actually make for better pictures that you could take than a filter because a filter is only going to give you sort of like a solid one color usually. Yeah, you can kind of see it's got its back legs grasping and its front legs are sort of digging around. Here's the back legs and then its front legs are basically climbing you can see they're kind of hooked. Its body is sort of shaped like a scallop in a way. It's hard to keep it in focus because it keeps sort of fumbling around on this big particle. <laughs> yeah, he's having a wrestling match with lunch. Uh, yeah, it could be. Um, you know... Hey, Jangir, hello. How are you doing? I haven't seen you in a really long time. Hopefully you're, uh, you're doing well. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they'll eat lichen, but, uh, this one's probably perturbed because, um, you know, usually they're on a stick, which is a pretty stable surface. And right now this one's just on a sheet of glass, basically, because that's micro microscope slides. And so the particle that it's climbing around on is basically free to rotate, which normally it probably would be fixed. Um, your six-year-old little girl has a question. Oh, lay it on me. I'll see if I can answer it. Hopefully your uh, six-year-old little girl's not an expert, or else I could be in trouble. <laughs> Uh, cause I know a little bit about water bears, but, uh, I know a lot more about diatoms. So, I kind of wish it would transfer over to that bigger particle, <laughs> bigger piece of lichen. So it stops spinning around quite so much. See some little ciliates crawling around in here as well. Uh, 
because we're zoomed in, I can just sort of bump the field of view a little with my camera. Uh, let's see, is it safe to assume I studied petrography? I studied petrography, yes, especially carbonate petrography or petrology, uh, both. And um, I know I haven't put a lot of, I keep talking about one of these days, I'm going to bring some rocks and stuff in and do some microscope streams with the uh, minerals, but uh, probably it's something for the new year. Um, we could do some rocks and mineral streams. I don't want um, to bust in too much to uh, Volcano Docs, going to have a microscope and stream a little bit. Uh, in the new year we're doing some rocks and mineral streams she'll probably mostly do the igneous stuff though so maybe if i did carbonates it would be all right uh the cartoon octonauts has an episode on water bears and she wants to know if they really can live in or near really hot places like lava uh, so water bears can handle temperatures in their tune state when they're um, when they're dehydrated, uh, it's sort of like a, sort of like hibernation, but it's not really hibernation. Um, they can handle temperatures above 300 degrees. Um, so like you could put them in the oven. Uh, lava is much, much hotter than that. And so it's very unlikely that they could handle temperatures, um, uh, like lava. Because lava is going to be, depending on what kind of lava it is, anywhere between like 500 degrees Celsius um, up to like 2,000 degrees Celsius. So um, that's way higher than a water bear could handle. And even in the case of like, you know, if you baked it in a lasagna uh, in your oven at 350, they would only be able to survive under those conditions if they were um, in their insisted state, if they were dehydrated. And um, so if they were crawling around like this, they could they would die if you got the temperatures up in the 70 degrees Celsius range. So they definitely couldn't handle anything up there. Um, but uh, in their tune state, in their, uh, in their insisted state or dried out state, uh, it's a cryptobiotic state, really. Um, they can handle those sort of temperatures. Probably not for if it was if it was baked into a lasagna at 350 degrees, it probably would kill it after the first hour. So if you were doing one of those long baked lasagnas, uh, it probably wouldn't survive. Um, but they have done experiments where they put some in their dehydrated states in temperatures about 300 degrees for about 10 minutes and then took them out and rehydrated them. And, uh, and I think that a fraction of them managed to live through that. <laughs> the diatom lasagna. Is there any other kind, Hannah? Um, so I, that would be delicious for a water bear, probably. Um, hello, Hannah and Joe. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can remember my commands. There's a Hannah Rebecca music uh, shout out. And, you know, I don't remember if I ever did like a, a Radio Joe one. I guess I didn't. Um, just have to do it the hard way. Hey, Two Chooks, hello. Um, thank you for the subscription to Joseph. This uh, water bear's a little out of focus while I'm typing and talking. There. There he is. He's crawling around. You can see they've got like a little uh, suction face thing, like a vacuum cleaner, basically. Um, and then that's how they eat. That's how they interact with things. Um, most water bears don't have eyes. Uh, I can't tell you whether this one does or not. I can't find one that's sitting still long enough for me to see them. But um, 
Most of them don't have eyes at all. They might have little patches where they sort of can sense light a little bit. Is it radio? Maybe I do have one. No. Uh, but I think if you type radio, you get the little Joseph emote pop up. I don't know where it went. <laughs> Fellow best coasters, yeah. Um, did I miss something other than Joseph's subscription? Okay, so hopefully, um, Janjir, I answered your daughter's question about water bears. They probably couldn't live like that uh, next to lava. So uh, if the waters were hot, but not quite um, 500 degrees Celsius hot, they could probably live in it for a short time. Um, some water bears are basically adapted towards uh, cold conditions. Like they actually will only activate when the temperature gets below a certain temperature range. And so they do, do really well in places like Antarctica and um, uh, uh, or high elevation places. Um, some of them are a little bit more temperate, like this one's probably more uh, temperate because we don't have super cold temperatures in Indiana typically, and um, not for long anyway. Um, they'll activate for a short period, um, try to sort of collect resources while the stick in this case is wet, and then um, get enough basically to keep going for a while or to, to interact with other water bears and then lay eggs or whatever else they would do to complete their life cycles. Um, many of the water bears will go through um, that sort of dehydrated state and come, coming sort of back to life, if you will, uh, many times. Um, and they can remain in that sort of inactive state for, I think, decades or longer um, without any trouble. Once they're in it, basically, they're, there's not much uh, there's not much there, right? Yeah, like a little Lazarus. They you just add some water. It's more like uh, water bear hot chocolate. <laughs> you know, you add a little bit of water, and then you got hot chocolate, and then you let it dry out, and you got powdered chocolate again. <laughs> One lasted 140 years. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, once you're in a dehydrated state, most organisms are good for a really long time. They had some nematodes and, uh, and rotifers and things like that they brought back from thousands of years old uh, without really any trouble. And I imagine water bears are, probably could last much longer than 140 years. Yeah. Um, everything that fits in the mouth is food, basically. Um, for a water bear, and for most things that are little, uh, most microscopic organisms, if they have a mouth, um, you know, that's, that's essentially the, the gape size or the size of the mouth sort of determines what they could eat, um, especially if they don't have eyes, right? They just shove things in there, um, although they may be able to, to use sort of chemical sensors to detect things to tell whether it's dirt or actual food. Um, some water bears have eyes, Hannah. Uh, many of them do not. Uh, and the ones that have eyes are kind of creepy sometimes. Um, their eyes are sometimes on these like little stalk-like things that come away from their bodies. Um, or occasionally they are just like light sensitive spots on their head. Um, you know, even if they have sight, it's, it's probably not very good sight. So she was very excited. <laughs> you just got her head back, your headset back. Okay. Um, well, I was excited too. I thought she was going to throw something really hard at me. And, uh, a question I can answer is a good one. Um, I did a bunch of, uh, like last year in the spring, I did a bunch of little lectures, um, as a, uh, as a cartoon scientist that we called Dr. Mo, 
and you can find him on YouTube. I think uh, I think it's associated with a different channel than the, than my normal YouTube channel, but um, I definitely talk about extremophiles and um, and all the different organisms that sort of count as extremophiles, and uh, and some of the things that they can tolerate. Um, but there's a lot of really good information out there about um, uh, organisms that can handle really, uh, really extreme conditions. Um, everybody loves water bears because I think because they're uh, associated with bears. I mean, people like to think of them as sort of like bear shaped. I guess they are sort of bear shaped. Um, although, uh, they're also a little bit maggot shaped in my opinion. I mean, they are cute. Uh, they have cute little newt newt faces, and uh, and they uh, they do a lot of like clambering around like a little baby, you know. So, um, but uh, the other things that are in here in this same sample, the nematodes and the rotifers are also extremophiles, and they also um, can handle being dehydrated for a really long time. Um, and they're actually much more common, um, which I guess makes it, I don't know, less interesting for people, but it's a lot easier for me to find a, a deloid rotifer in here. <laughs> Beholder shaped. <laughs> there's a little D and D reference for you. Oh, there's a ciliate that just sort of swam into our field of view down here and then swam out of it. A little single celled ciliate sort of, oh, it's still swimming around in the background a little bit. It's like a doing circle laps right there. It's this dark blob. That's a ciliate. Uh, it just photobombed our, our water bear. Hey, Pacific Plankton, hello. How are you? Hopefully you're, uh, you're watching while you need bread or whatever. Um, Uh, I looked at some samples earlier today. These are from uh, some sticks that I collected in my driveway and also some sticks that were on the roof of my house. Uh, our bedroom has like a uh, the porch roof, which is really flat. And I can just stick half my body sort of out the window and grab some sticks. Uh, so I did that. Uh, and then I collected some more from the driveway once you start kneading the bread, you won't be able to chat. Okay. Um, and then to get this sample uh, for you guys, what I did was the normal thing that I usually do, which is take a knife and I just kind of uh, lightly scrape off the lichen and the moss and anything that sort of doesn't look like it belongs on the stick. Um, and in this case, it was sort of like a combination of really light colored lichen, like a sort of um, sage colored lichen and then some kind of green, uh, darker greens and, uh, and brown colored lichens. And, um, I just sort of scraped them into sour cream container. Uh, I like to recycle. Uh, was the stick slimy? No. Um, well, one of the sticks, two of the sticks were from the driveway. They're just little tiny sticks. Um, and so uh, they were still sort of wet. It's been raining here. And uh, so the lichen came off very easily. And then the ones that were on the roof were a little bit drier. And um, I was a little worried that if I just used the ones from the driveway, we might get some stuff that had been uh, uh, dormant because it's been raining and wet um for a while and i thought i want something that's um it's not been awake for a really long time so that i could kind of wake it up by adding water to it and then i scraped it with a knife into this little container uh you can kind of see into there i think um, and then i have just a little pipette um and i let it settle just a little bit so you can maybe i can get that close enough that you can kind of see there's like a dark a uh, bit of junk 
and uh, I just drop that onto a piece of microscope glass and um, I didn't even put a cover slip on it because I didn't want to squish anything but it, it kind of limits how close we can get to the um, the water bearer but that's okay because I can always zoom in with my optical zoom on my camera um, if we needed to get a little closer we can just click in a, a notch um, and because I'm on I just have a 10x objective on here that's uh, that's actually the correct scale bar now it was a little off before um, but then you can see this one's actually kind of large uh, for a water bear. It's kind of a big girl. And uh, let's see, I could fix that. If I was paying attention, we're actually at this scale most of the time. Um, so a tenth of a millimeter is about, Yeah, it's about maybe a quarter of a millimeter in size, this one is. So pretty, pretty chunky. Um, and it's broken free from the little thing it was stuck to, which is nice because now it's gonna basically stay on the sheet of glass for a little bit. You can see it's exploring. Uh, it could be. Usually you can see the eggs inside them if they're gravid. Um, some of them just get kind of big if they've been around for a while. <laughs> thick, yeah, it's a thick water bear. <laughs> uh, she's got it going on, for sure. Uh, somewhere in here we have a, uh, where's that go? There we go. Got a little Cardi B. That's a, uh, that's a tardy bee right there, the uh, the sexy water bear. We'll put her up there in the corner. <laughs> uh, she's been out uh, in the sun a little too long without sunscreen on, but uh, that's a, a little gif made by uh, a fellow streamer, my friend Little Chook. She hasn't been streaming for a while because I think little Chook is gravid. Uh, but there's little Chook when she streams. Um, she's an artist and she uh, really digs water bears. And for a little while she was making these, uh, uh, some kind of like felt water bears that she was selling. <laughs> gravid Chook, yeah, I think she is. Um, but I think we were calling that one Tardy B. Tardy B, the Tardy Grade Water Bear. And I think they even used that little logo for, um, like a brewing company used the, the water bear. She had like beers in each hand or something. So. Is there a tardy A and a tardy C? Uh, not that I know of. But uh, I think her... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. She also did a... She's an amazing artist. Um, she's helped me with a lot of things. And uh, there she had like a little water bear account. Um, and that reminds me, I used to have like a little... Uh... I forget what it was. Newt. There we go. I added to the water bear counter. Um, when I first started streaming uh, from the microscope, we had some water bears. Hey, how's it going, Bluesy? Um, and uh, uh, one of them my daughter collected. Uh, she actually went out and found the stick, scraped the um, stick herself into a little container, and then prepped the sample. 
and then uh, put the sample on the slide and found it on the microscope uh, all on a stream, which was pretty amazing. And then uh, we saved the little slide that it was on. It's still here somewhere. Uh, that water bear we named Gubu, I believe. Uh, and somewhere I still have a, a slide with Gubu on it. I thought maybe we should bring him back to life one of these days because he's just been sitting on a microscope slide since then for like a year. I'm pretty sure Gubu lives though. Yeah, just add water. Perfect. And uh, Gubu's already on a slide. So that's an advantage. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at this water bear and there's some other things I kind of want to look around in the sample, see if we can find. I can find my way back to this one. Uh, if I need to. We've been like just watching one water bear for like, I don't know, however long I've been on. 30, 30 minutes now. <laughs> Maybe I should look around a little. Stop, uh, stop stalking this one water bear. Uh, can I mark the coordinates? No, but I can look at where I am on the slide and then I can kind of lead us back here eventually. Uh, because I know where I am on the slide. And it's a big slide. I can get us kind of close and then I'll probably see that thing crawling around. There's a little nematode. It's not doing their characteristic wiggle. We're just kind of drifting in the the mix. Let's see what else we can find. I mentioned there's oh no, there is a giant water bear. Now that one is huge. That is full size. There you go. That is a big girl. Uh, it's, um, that's like three times, twice, two to three times as big as that last water bear was. It's a different species. Um, and it's still, it's, it's still sort of red, but it doesn't have quite the, uh, the same markings on the outside. You can see, you get a really good look at its back legs. Right there. And then... Let's see if we can zoom in on its face a little bit. It's got them kind of tucked in here. Uh, our water bears... Insects, no. Um, they're not insects because they have eight legs, so that's a good clue that they're not an insect. And insects also have to have three body parts. Oh, this one's got the little eye stalks. Uh, you s see those little like whisker-like things coming off of the head? Uh, they're only in focus for a couple of seconds because she's crawling. Let's see if I can get them to come back in. Right there. Right there, you can see she's got like little eye stalks sticking out. She's got eyes. She's a big girl and just jutting out from the head on both sides are these little tiny stalks. Neon coffee cat, hi, new here. Is that a tardigrade? Yes, it is. Um, yeah, so water bears have eight legs and uh, tardigrade is the tardy, I think tardy grade is pretty close to the group that they're in, um, which is their own group. They're their own thing. Um, not an insect, not a spider, just their own little thing. They got their own group.
yeah, they they don't belong to the arachnids either. They are um, absolutely their own little. They got their own little group called Tardigrata or whatever. You can really get a sense of see. There's this the three legs that they kind of crawl around with. And there's our head. You can get a really good sense of those little eye stalk things that are coming off of the front of her head. One of the legs is here. Let's see if I can get my little arrow over. One leg is here, and one's there, one's here, one's there. And so you can really see the little claws on the ends of her, right at the end of each of her feet. She has little tiny claws. We can get a really good look at them right there. And the back legs, as I mentioned, are kind of paired and a little bit like a scallop. And you can kind of see them here. Um, and they're kind of reversed. Uh, in other words, they only flex like under her body. They only flex this way. Um, whereas these ones are kind of independent legs. This one's kind of paired together. And their little claws on the back end are for grasping things um, to hold the water bear in place more or less. And then kind of like a scallop, the legs only fold under. Um, on, under the body and then the front legs they have uh, six of those and they work independently to sort of yeah clamber around or grasp things and then typical water bear heads um, are just that was a rotifer flying through there um, barely differentiated from their body so it's just like a sleeping bag right that comes up um, all one piece and then this one's got a bunch of little sort of like whiskery eye stalks and then those usually surround a little newt newt mouth uh, that's like a vacuum cleaner basically that is a really big water bear though I think it's probably the biggest one I've had on here you can see it clearly There's a little, there's a little rotifer in our field of view as well, just kind of crawling in and out. Uh, something that people probably aren't aware of is uh, geologically speaking, water bears are because they're extremophiles, let's see, this is, nope, wait, that's the size we're at right there. Um, because of their uh, extremophile status, they actually evolved really early. And um, geologically, there are basically five extinction events in geologic history where mass extinction events where things have died off the dinosaurs dying off at the kt boundary um, is one example of that where a meteorite struck the earth and um, uh, the water bears lived right through that one and in fact all five of those major extinction events where most of the organisms on planet earth died well Dinosaurs as dinosaurs went extinct. They continued on more or less as something different, bird-like organisms. And not all dinosaurs uh, made it through. So uh, the theropod dinosaurs all died off. No, didn't die off. Uh, the sauropod dinosaurs all died off. But um, the... Uh, Water bears lived through all the extinction events, every one of them. So all five of those mass extinction events, uh, they just managed to go right through them. And so we know that they, we have records of them basically from some of our earliest fossils. Um, and, and like I said, they, that, that ability to sort of persist through really difficult conditions, um, sort of allows them to to do, to be able to sort of 
continue on when other organisms wouldn't be able to. Um, there's a common misperception, though, uh, that water bears are indestructible. And I would actually argue that um, in their tuned states, they're fairly indestructible. Uh, they can handle really high ultraviolet radiation. They can handle really high pressure, really low pressure, acid conditions, uh, high temperatures, very low temperatures. All of those things are things they could live through. And, um, but not like this, not crawling around, not, um, not walking around. They'd have to be in basically suspended animation. Um, their tune states are, are this sort of like characteristic, uh, dried out, desiccated state. And that's the only way that you'll ever see them, uh, living through things. If you were to squish a, a water bear with a cover slip, you could kill it. If you were to put this living water bear in high temperatures or low temperatures, you would kill it. Um, so don't go thinking that just because they can persist through conditions that they are um, sort of super organisms. Um, they're only able to do that when they're hibernating, uh, when they're in this sort of like cryptobiotic state where they're not quite living. Um, they're not dead, but they're not quite living either. They're basically completely little dehydrated uh, balls, basically. So yeah, don't kill them. Um, yeah, it's not quite hibernation. And the reason that I was trying to be really careful about saying it's not hibernation is that I'm a scientist and hibernation is a specific term that means you have to slow your heart rate down. Um, and so it's not technically hibernation. They just dry out and they desiccate. Um, it's a really sort of a technical difference, right? So, um, yeah, don't, uh, don't do weird things to the water bears. Leave it to the scientists to do weird things to just a couple of them. Um, we don't need people harassing them. And, um, especially not, this one's really gorgeous. What a giant water bear. And I'm really glad I didn't put a cover slip on this because it means that when I'm done, I can just rinse the slide off into the, um, back into the sour cream container that I have. And then I can just dump it back into the yard and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, it'll be fine. Hopefully. This is such a giant water bear. Let's see, I'm gonna fix this. It's actually that size. And then, yeah, it's a chunky one. Uh, and then I wanna do this. There we go, I just wanna track that. Happy New Year, you're off to bed, okay. Uh, Bluesy, I hope you have a great new year and thanks for dropping by. I don't know if it's, uh, you're already in 2022? I think maybe you are. So enjoy. And let's let this uh, lady go on with her business and look at some of these other things that are in here. We can always come back to this one as well. It's not actually that far from the other one. There's a uh, nematode. This is their normal pattern. They're spazzy. Oh, there's another water bear right there. I told you they were kind of rare, but we have that one. Is that the same one? Maybe that's the same one. Maybe up was down and I just got, got the same one back on there. Let's go looking around though. Let's see if we can find something else. That is another nematode. Usually if you see particles just kind of wobbling around like that, uh, it's a nematode usually. 
And they're pretty strong for being such little guys. Also, I don't know if you can see this easily. The little nematode just blocked it for the most part, but let's zoom in on this thing. That is a butterfly scale or potentially a moth scale. Um, people don't realize it, but um, butterflies, they look like they're, they're furry um, or hairy sometimes. And moths are the same way, but all of those are actually just modified little scales. And uh, that thing right there is a tiny little butterfly scale. So like on their wing, they're covered with these little tiny scales and they make all the colors. Um, that's the actual scale of a butterfly right there. And I can tell just because I've seen them before. And also uh, before this nematode stuck a bunch of junk in front of it, um, I saw the other side of it so I could see the whole scale shape. You can't see it now because it's, um, you know, it's stuck in between uh, this pile of junk right here. Uh, it wasn't there when this when we started the the nematode is here and they kind of squ squished it onto the front of this thing. Um, but that's the right there is a, a butterfly scale, a single scale from a butterfly and their bodies are made up. Uh, I mean, they have all of these little scales that cover over the feathers or the wings, really, um, like feathers, I mean, and um, we'll go put a little water bear in the corner instead of our, um, those are all over their bodies. And so we've looked at those on the SEM before, and that's another reason why I know what it is just from glancing at it is that from the SEM, I got used to seeing them. So, yeah, it's not pigment that makes the color, it comes from the structure of the scales for butterflies and for moths. It's mostly um, physical color, yeah, which is sort of cool. The, um... there we go. This, all this stuff was found just on a stick or a couple of sticks in my driveway that kind of I mixed together. So I didn't have to go far. And one of the things is that it doesn't get super cold here in the winter. So we can always um, do a little exploration of sticks or tree bark, or I do have a pond, um, which is not frozen over currently, despite it being a few hours from January 1st. We had 60 degrees, 65 degree weather for, thanks, uh, for Christmas, <laughs> so. Um, this little guy that we're looking at right now is a rotifer. Uh, it's a deloid rotifer. And <laughs> can I quantum entangle one in a s <laughs> on stream for us? Uh, I don't think I can quantum entangle one, but I can put one on the scanning electron microscope for you. Not today. It looks a little bit like a saw. Yeah, the... Um, the cilia, which are actually just a bunch of little kind of hair-like things, are actually doing like this. They're sitting sitting in one place and they're just um, twisting. But the, um, the fact that all of them are doing it makes it look like they're actually spinning like a saw. So um, this uh, is the, the mouth for this organism is actually, let me try to get this for you. It's actually right in between those. Um, this structure is called a corona. It's at the top or the head, like a crown. That's what that word means. Um, right here, when it spins, you can see the particles are being pulled towards its mouth and its mouth is in the middle of that. So it spins the, the, uh, the cilia um, in tiny little, you know, sort of in, in place in tiny little circles and then all of them together create um, a sort of draw towards their mouth. And you can see the particles here are actually being pulled towards its mouth. And some of them go into the mouth, which is basically in here, right in between those two um, spinning corona ciliates. Yeah, it's literally making a vacuum. Um, it's like a little vacuum cleaner. 
and um, and then it has uh, it's uh, it's got a mouth like structure in here in the middle that it uses to chew and then its stomach is back here somewhere and it's got a little heart um, it's a tiny animal um, and then at the very back end of these things they usually have uh, uh, like a toe with three little claws and it's holding on with the three little claws so yeah like a tiny Roomba so a <laughs> brush sweeper yeah basically so oh there was a paper where they quantum entangled a water bear okay well i don't have quantum entanglement power so uh the little rainbow or opal thing oh that we passed it's actually just um the the thing that we passed that was like a little um opal is just by refringence it's from um little quartz grains or silt grains um that are in the sample and uh it's a result of i have a polarizer a very weak polarizer that's built into the microscope here so it uh it makes the appearance of color where there isn't any here you can see it's let go with its foot if i could get it in focus in time before it crawls out there that's the little rotifer and it's still holding on with its back foot now and coming off the top of its head let's see if we get it to spin back around you can see there's a little oops didn't mean to do that off the top of it well it's a little too active let's see if i zoom out a level maybe we can keep it in the field of view long enough for me to point at it but it's got sort of a little uh, appendage sticking off its head which is called an antenna where'd he go where'd she go rather i might have to find another one it seems like that one just disappeared on us probably went behind something there's a nematode doing its little dance there's another one right here you can see this sort of crawl they push their head forward, stretch out, and then uh, inch their way around. And on the back end of that, you would see it's right at the meniscus uh, for this material that's on the stage, which makes it a little challenging. Let's see if we can find a bigger one. Uh, Rotifers also come in all kinds of sizes there. That's the bit of the butterfly wing. Uh, not wing, but scale. Let's see if we can find another one. There's a bunch of different rotifers that might be out, around in here. Um, usually they're easier to find than, um, than water bears are. Like the nematodes, they also, like there's another nematode, they tend to kind of wiggle stuff around a lot. And see that nematode, they just have a characteristic motion, kind of dancing. Yeah, like a rave, <laughs> a little bit like a rave. And uh, it, yeah, um, I think that was Jan Cheer was asking about the biofringent materials. So you can see there's some right there. Uh, I pass over some of the it's just a little piece of silica, I think. It's a little tiny silk grain. Uh, that you can see, it's got, sorry, a little uh, geology for you while I'm here. Um, in regular light, this would be clear. Uh, and then the, the polarizer is actually um, highlighting the, the face of the um, of this clast, which is a silt-sized particle. And um, this is what we would call conchoidal fracturing, which makes me think this is probably quartz, because uh, that's the way quartz breaks. This one actually has got straight edges, and um, these are cleavage planes probably, um, because they're straight on both sides, and there's a straight bar in the middle, and then it looks like they... Um, they break off at the same angle here. So uh, 
probably some feldspar. Can't guarantee it, but would be my guess. There's a nematode that's not that's done dancing for a while. <laughs> it's taking a little break, having a bit of a nap. That is a couple of rotifers right there. Like I said, they're usually pretty common in samples. There's another nematode going nuts. There's one that's a little bit calmer. It's done dancing. Another rotifer or nematode, sorry. They do a lot of just. Oh, there's a little water bear off on its own. I don't think that's the one that we saw before. It's in a different place on the slide, like a totally different place. Uh, like the one that we first started with was kind of this shape and armored like this one is. As you can see its little newt newt face sticking out right there. Gotta go. All right. Have a great uh, New Year's, Hannah. And uh, give you another shout out while we're here. Um, if you don't know who uh, Hannah Rebecca is, you should uh, give her a follow. I'm not saying that lightly. Uh, I'm usually at all of her streams. Um, does a bunch of indie folk and some original music as well. I'm sure that you would like it. She's got a great singing voice and she's often accompanied by her fiance, Joseph, Radio Joe. Uh, do these creatures live everywhere in the world? Um, water bears can be found in most places. Um, I know that they've found them in Antarctica. And so I, I would think that they range everywhere from Antarctica to, uh, to the Arctic. Um, and they're found at the top of the Himalayas, and they've been found in, like, the deserts of the southwest. So I'm not sure if they're absolutely everywhere, but they're probably most places. So um, because they are dust-sized or maybe a little bit bigger, uh, when they dry out, they can be blown around. And I think that's how they mostly get distributed um, around planet Earth is in the wind. Um, in Antarctica, they have these things called Kraikenite holes, which are basically, uh, so there's a concept in science that uh, like white reflects light and dark absorbs light or energy. Um, and so um, these Kraikenite holes are places where dust lands on top of uh, the snow in Antarctica and the dust actually is a little bit darker colored and it melts a little bit of the snow during the day. And eventually more dust piles into these little pits or depressions, which grow. And because the dust is darker than the snow, basically they keep growing until they're, you know, little puddles basically. And during the daytime, they have enough light, they absorb enough energy and um, they create these little water pools. And then in the nighttime they freeze um, and so they have this uh, really interesting environment called Kraikenite pits that <laughs> are all just tardy grades in the wind. Um, if only we'd be that lucky. Um, yeah, so the Kraikenite pits are um, places where water bears have been found in Antarctica. So we, we presume that they get carried in um, by the wind and then deposited in these places. So... Um, because they only form from wind blowing dust into those spots, uh, that it would be hard to imagine that there was another way to get them to migrate there. And there's not a lot of organisms that, there are a bunch of organisms that live there. They're all microscopic. So um, it's a pretty interesting kind of an environment uh, where these tiny little pools on top of the snow in Antarctica and in other places, um, but they're pretty good clue for us as scientists that um, that 
the organisms that are found there must be carried in by the wind because there's not really any other way for them to get there. It's not like there's birds that are going to just visit these tiny little, you know, mud depressions or dirt depressions in the snow. And, um, and the water bears themselves can't traverse enough distance basically to, um, to get very far. So that's not going to be uh, a reasonable way to get them into those pits by like crawling, for example. Um, and they get populated pretty quickly, which means there must be a fair amount of just, you know, dehydrated water bears flying around in the atmosphere. Um, and, you know, potentially that means we're breathing them in. So, hey, Carlos, how's it going? Uh, Happy New Year. And you're... Yeah, you're probably in the new year already. We're in the past year. So we're just looking at some water bears and a little bit of some nematodes and deloid rotifers. We're kind of having fun looking at some living stuff uh, that I found on sticks in my driveway. So <laughs> you don't want to breathe the water bears in. Um, they've also found diatoms in these Krykenite pits. Uh, and, you know, Carlos is here. Maybe Carlos could even tell us about him. Uh, I think he works in Antarctica. Um, but they also get blown around in the dust, uh, in the wind, and um, populate these little Krykenite pits. And um, uh, diatoms are also a type of a stream extremophile. People don't uh, don't realize it, but. Um, Part of the reason I'm interested in extremophiles and in the weird places that they're found and the weird conditions that they're found in is that um, it also, yeah, diatoms are in the wind around the world. Uh, in fact, they have some pretty cool studies that have shown um, that there's been volcanic eruptions. They'll find these um, endemic species that are located in these uh, downwind areas from where the volcanoes erupt so that we know that um, that they can actually be carried in, um, in eruption events sometimes <laughs> to new places, to places they didn't exist before, uh, which is pretty cool. So, It's been a while since I did a stream where I was just on my, um, <laughs> stay out of you. <laughs> um, I, probably most of them would just get digested and come right back out. Not a big deal. Uh, you know, if they're in their tuned state, maybe they're crawling around inside you for a little bit because, uh, stomach acids may not digest them. Uh, but some of them probably end up in your, in your lungs. Well, if you don't like it, I guess it's another reason to wear a mask. <laughs> they probably would get caught in those uh, N95 masks. <laughs> uh, are there many types of water bears or only two kinds? Uh, I don't remember where I saw that they found saltwater bears. Uh, there's like 500 known species of water bears or something like that. Um, and they have different genera. So there's way more than two. Uh, in my sample here, we've only seen two kinds. We saw that really big lady, uh, and then we've seen these little armored guys, and um, I've seen another type. That, that's actually the first time I've seen that really big one uh, on a stream um, from my yard. Yeah, there's a lot, uh, and that number may be an underestimate um, because a lot of microscopic stuff we don't... We don't have a very good handle on the diversity of, um, of most of the really little things. Like, um, I think I was talking to another diatomist about, uh, um, Zlatko about, uh, a site where he was looking at a single lake, um, in Lake Orid, and he's been looking at the diversity in that site and he found something like a thousand new species just in one lake. Um, by spending, you know, by looking very critically at it. And it's an old lake, so it actually is likely to have, you know, more than that. But um, think of all the lakes that we haven't looked in and all the places where we haven't looked for many of these things. Um, 
they're probably pretty underexplored. And there's a pretty large bias in science towards larger organisms. Um, if you look at like just even insects, for example, there's a fairly large fraction of insects which we haven't discovered yet. And scientists estimate that the numbers are actually much, much larger, like millions of insect species, um, potentially, that we haven't, oh, well, maybe a million, um, that we haven't identified yet because they're small and we haven't been everywhere or we've been places, but we weren't looking at it critically. Um, and uh, even if you just look at like soil mites, uh, there's so few people working on soil mites that there's tens of thousands of undescribed species of soil mites in the U.S. Um, you know, nobody just, they don't even know, they, they know roughly where they belong in terms of what genus or group even. Um, but our bias, if you look at like how many things that are like plants or, or animals, um, the number of those that they project as, to, as being undescribed is very small relative to that. So uh, we have a pretty, like I said, a pretty large bias towards um, things we can see, right? The invisible world is the, the reason probably you're tuning in uh, is because this is a chance to, a portal into that uh, invisible world that we don't normally get a chance to look into. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, that's, that's part of the appeal of it is it's this invisible world that's around everybody that is filled with all these sort of interesting critters and plants and algae and many of it many of them are basically unknown or not not well known anyway i think that's another water bear i think it's hiding on the other side of this pile of junk um, okay, well, I did want to see if I could get a little close-up of a rotifer again so we could kind of get another look at them. See if I can find one for us. I just saw a ciliate go sliding into this. That's a rotifer, but it's mostly behind stuff. I wanted to find one that's kind of out in the open a little. And then, uh, oh, there's a, a rotifer, a deloid rotifer. Uh, just because I want to talk a little bit about the deloid rotifers. As I said, most people are kind of fascinated by water bears, and I feel like they should have equal fascination for, for rotifers. And there really isn't. And I don't know why, because I think they're equally cute. Um, they've got sort of giant vacuum cleaner bristle heads. And um, they can also be dehydrated and exposed to all the same things that water bears can. Um, and they're easier to find, usually, like this little one. Sometimes it's fun to sweat the small stuff, yeah. So um, that's a that's a deloid rotifer right there. And uh, again, these are super interesting. Um, all deloid rotifers they need a cuter name, yeah. Well, I'm not sure what we could call them. Uh, inchworms or something? They're kind of like little inchworms, but I don't know what a good name for them would be. Um, bears are already taken. We'll have to come up with something cute. But, uh, well, what I was going to say is they're all female. Um, every one of the deloid rotifers, not all rotifers, but all deloid rotifers are female. And, um, they're actually more capable of withstanding, um, irradiation, like from, from space. Oh, there's that big old big mama right there still around still kicking um they're actually as i was saying they're actually more capable of withstanding um irradiation like from space 
And uh, another cool thing about them is they've been only female. There's only female deloid rotifers, and it's been that way for some species. They estimate they've only been female for the minimum is 10 million years that they've all been female. And the sort of the median age people have put on there is that for 75 million years, um, they've only had female deloid rotifers. And to me, that's a fascinating organism um, where they don't have uh, male and female, they just have female. Um, and the female will lay eggs. They do not need to be fertilized. They are clones of the, uh, of the mama and they will just make their own. They just clone themselves basically when they want to reproduce or when they have conditions that allow them to reproduce. And they've managed to be that way for 75 million years. Think about the success required of an organism to be around on planet Earth for 75 million years. And then add to that that they haven't had sex. They've just basically had one uh, line responsible for each one of those organisms that leads back to, uh, you know, they're all clones. Um, and there may be some genetic diversity in those. But for that um, 75 million years, they've they've just been cloning themselves and cloning themselves. <laughs> it's a long dry spell. Yeah. Uh, I don't mean to, uh, to bring up Betty White, but they've probably got some dusty muffins. So, um, the, uh, uh, that period is, uh, is pretty impressive for an organism to go Basically, the, you think about the strength of their genes, their adaptability, or their ability to persevere for that long and have no real evolution of the organism, no adaptability, really. Um, and I say that, and I mean it kind of literally, because one of the ways that organisms can evolve is through um, genetic mutation. But uh, the Deloid rotifers basically repair genetic damage and... Um, that's one of the ways that they manage to persist is that they actually don't evolve. They've just stayed the same and they've managed to basically repair genetic damage and persist as only females for 75 million years. Um, you know, that's, that's the age of the dinosaurs. Since the age of the dinosaurs, these things have just been all female, just making clones, laying eggs, and continuing on. And they've managed to basically occur all over the world, colonize all kinds of environments. And, uh, and they don't care. Uh, high temperatures, pH, pressure, whatever. Um, yeah, it's a sad day we lost Betty White. Um, but the... Uh, she had a good run though. Um, but, you know, think about that as an organism, that, that the accomplishment of basically living as long as the dinosaurs had been around, the fossils of the dinosaurs that we've uncovered. So, um, pretty amazing. All right, well, I'm at the point where my microscope uh, time was at six o'clock been running for about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I just wanted to do a little stream, sort of have some fun, look around at some rotifers and some water bears and, um, and uh, some nematodes. And I don't know, maybe we'll catch a mite one of these times. I think we've done that before. Uh, found some ciliates that sort of cruising around in these samples. Um, sometimes we find uh, some amoeba, but uh, it's been a fun little stream. Uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out, Ginger, and uh, and everyone else. Thank you for the subscriptions from Sam Shang and from Joseph Radio Joe. Um, did I finish Hollow Knight? Yeah, I finished Hollow Knight, and I also played through all of Ori, both Ori's. Um, I'm waiting for the new Hollow Knight to come out. Uh, and also, there's a new 
expansion for uh, for the bird game that uh, that Pacific and I always play, Wingspan, and um, so I'm sort of waiting for those games to come out. Keeping you company in the kitchen, yeah, uh, anytime Pacific, and uh, it's fun to do sort of. Well, I've got my puzzle game that counts as co-op. Um, but I probably, we could play some co-op games if you wanted to, Sam Um, I don't know, probably the next week is the best time for it, because I'm kind of still not back to work yet. But, um, hang out in the Discord if you wanted to catch up and chat about something, or see what we've been doing. Uh, I put some stuff in there relatively recently. Um, and I'll probably do some SEM streams this week. Um, I mentioned... To some people in the uh, Discord as well, we got a six thousand dollar grant to continue working on some SEM stuff from White Sands National Park, and I think that um, there's some plans to eventually fly me down there to do some field work uh, in White Sands to collect diatoms, which would be pretty cool. So um, thanks for hanging out, everyone, and I think probably I should try to find us somebody to raid. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go get Zoikia Media. It's their birthday. I think that's a good reason to uh, give them a raid. And <laughs> if I need help, I will let you know. Uh, Zoikia Media. I think that's what I wanted. Uh, it's their birthday. I think they're streaming all day on their birthday and uh, they're looking at ants. That's what they usually do anyway. Um, a science streamer. And uh, I like to raid people on their birthday. There's a rotifer. Um, let's see if we can find... There's a giant rotifer right there. And a little ciliat snuck into the stream. Um, all right. So, hey, Shadowfax, um, I'll leave you with that. Uh, thanks everybody. It's been a good year as a streamer and I'm um, looking forward to, um, getting some nice streams in next year as well. Probably some more bird stuff, some more moon stuff, some more SEM stuff, some light microscope stuff, the regular. Um, I hope everybody has a good New Year's Eve. Um, stay healthy, stay safe. Uh, if you're going to be out on the roads, be careful out there. Um, and if you're going to be around uh, people, mask up. Stay safe. Uh, the COVID stuff's going crazy right now. So, all right. Uh, we'll catch you next time. And uh, hopefully everybody will join me on this raid uh, for Zoika Media. All right. Goodbye.